Well, Razorback fans, the Razorback basketball team loses a game at home to a very good Alabama team. So what's going on here? They can't really play offense, but what can they do? We'll talk about that as well as get into the fact that this is another one in three start in SEC play for Arkansas, just like the past two years. But can they turn it around like the past two years? And also Nick Smith is going to play. It's all coming up on today's Locked on Razorbacks podcast. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And welcome into the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. I am your host, John Neighbors. I am also the host of Out of Bounds. You can catch every weekday afternoon from 1 to 4 on 103.7 The Buzz and 103.7 thebuzzcom Hope everybody's having a wonderful Thursday, and I apologize for not being able to do a podcast yesterday. I had some uh, business that I had to take care of, so I apologize. But uh, we're back for today because there's a lot of things to talk about, and it's going to be all basketball uh, for the Razorbacks because I actually had a chance last night to drive up to Alabama or drive up to Arkansas or the Fayetteville in Arkansas. I am Bama. See, I'm already uh, mixing it up as it is because I'm so tired. But anyways, I got to go to the game uh, up there at Bud Walton Arena. And uh, check out the game. And it was uh, obviously one that did not end well for the Razorbacks. I was excited about it. I felt like maybe there's a chance that Arkansas could win this game because anytime you're at Bud Walton, there's always magic that can happen. But unfortunately, it was just uh, too much Bama. Bama's a really good basketball team, without a doubt the best one in the SEC. And if they do not make it to the Sweet 16 this year, then it's a massive failure. Like They are that good of a basketball team, and they have so much talent and a lot of depth. But Arkansas, give them credit. They held their own for the majority of the game. Even uh, was in, I guess, a, a two-point lead for Bama with just about four minutes left to go into the game. Arkansas went on a really nice run, but with three straight threes getting hit by Alabama, uh, that was just pretty much all she wrote. So frustrating game for many reasons, which uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, specific breakdowns, but it, it really comes down to Arkansas just can't play offense right now. They can't play offense. Their offense is stagnant. It's not good. They can't shoot the ball very well from the outside. We all know that. Uh, their strength is going inside, but teams defensively are going to play really well against that and force Arkansas to take jump shots and three-point shots and all of that. And Alabama was no exception. I think they did a really good job against Arkansas and was able to keep the offense in check. And really, the disappointing thing from last night was not only the fact that Arkansas just, I mean, they shot okay. It was 42.6% from the field. And their free throw shooting still wasn't great at 15 of 23. But you really just had two bad games uh, from two particular players that you really need to have better performances from. Uh, Anthony Black, uh, love the kid and still, you know, I'm not saying he's a bad player, so don't misconstrue it. But uh, he did not play well last night. He went two of 12 from the field with 33 minutes of play. Uh, had five rebounds, but only five total points. Went one of five from the free throw line. He was the one redeeming quality against Alabama. He also had four turnovers. So a really bad game out of him. Jordan Walsh. You know, you need more out of him, but because of foul trouble and whatnot, he wasn't playing that much when he played 17 minutes. When one of five from the field had two points and two rebounds. That was his entire stat line. So your two five-star, your McDonald's All-American guys really had a struggling game. Uh, Ricky Council didn't play all that great either. He got it going in the second half, did finish with 15 points, but four of 10 from the field, hit seven of nine from the free throw line, but still had five turnovers himself. And so you just didn't have great performance that is out of them. Debo Davis played a good job defensively and may have been a lot better offensively. He got a double-double, 16 and 10. Uh, had no turnovers, did have three assists and two steals. So he had a really nice game, comparatively speaking, and his defense was really good against Brandon Miller, who uh, got shut down pretty much the entire game uh, until late because he had a, a couple of big points. He had 14, but still, Devo really shut him down. I don't think he got a shot off in the first three quarters of the game. But really, the story was about uh, Jalen Graham, which I know we'll talk about more in depth. He got 16 points in this game, five rebounds, eight of 10 from the field. And one of those shots was from three-point land. And so that, uh, that wasn't going to I mean, he really went eight of nine from the inside, provided a spark in 19 minutes of play. And uh, he, he was really one of the lone bright spots, spots offensively when it comes at least to consistency there, too. Uh, also, uh, if you just need to look at some other stats, because, again, we're going through the box score here. Uh Turnovers. Arkansas had 15 turnovers and Bama had 13. That's about even, right? I mean, it's, you don't want to have that many, neither did Bama. But the problem was is that points off of turnovers, Bama had 24, you had seven. So you had two more turnovers than them. Or they had, I should say, they had two less turnovers than you, but yet they scored 
an additional 17 points. That ain't getting it done. You also had fast break points very much in Bama's favor, 24 points to four points. So Arkansas was not able to get out and transition very easily. Uh, you had 10 offensive rebounds, got eight second chance points. So at least that was a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, you just, you, you can't play that way offensively against a team like Alabama and expect to win the game. So you got to give credit to, again to Alabama. They're the best team. And, you know, I think that in most cases, if Arkansas would have played the type of game they played last night against the majority of the SEC, they probably win. But because it's Bama, they ended up uh, losing in that fashion. So just a, just a real problem that uh, we continue to see offensively. And I think that it's a, a pretty, I wouldn't say it's a simple answer because it's never so simple in sports. But after the game, Eric Musselman did meet with the media and did say this about the offense and the struggles. And it's something that I feel like tells it all of what the problem is for Arkansas right now. As a coach, you know, the first thing you want is, you know, is your team playing hard? And I do think this team is playing hard. Um, but we're offensively challenged. Um, and and, and, that, and that's, that's a fact. That's not, a, that's not an opinion. Um, and there'd be a lot of other teams offensively challenged, too, if, if uh, two players that you built your roster around aren't here. Um, we're not, the, but nobody, nobody cares. And there's, and there's other injuries throughout athletics and all different sports and professional ranks and college ranks. And right now, um, we're still trying to figure out who we are. So a really interesting comment that I think everybody knows and understands, but to hear Eric Musselman bring it up and, and the way that he does is just, again, once it's really telling because it's not just something that it's my opinion or your opinion, it's coming straight from. Uh, the mouth of head coach Eric Musselman. And so it sucks. And that's the problem. Like that's really the whole unfortunate thing is that I, I believe this team is playing really hard. The effort is there. I think defensively they are really good. But you just can't sit there and tell me that losing two of your three best offensive players, and some people may disagree and that's fine, but I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail. But two of your top three offensive players, or at least your offensive presences, are gone off this team. You can't tell me that any other team in the country can have something like that happen and there not be a massive drop-off, just like Eric Musselman says. It's not an excuse. It's, it's you know, they still got to get it done and no one's feeling sorry for them. But it is a reason. It is reality. And I was just looking at it from uh, the perspective of, you know, with Nick Smith Jr., which, again, we'll talk about him too. But there's no question that he, when healthy, is your best offensive player. He can score from anywhere on the court. He can dunk. He can hit threes. He can hit free throws. He can do so many different things at a very high level. That's why he is projected to be a lottery pick, a top five pick in the NBA is because of how good he is. He's gone. Your number one option is gone. And even Trevin Brazil, some people say, oh, he's not two or three. But hear me out on this. When Trevin Brazil was healthy, he was averaging 12 points a game and 27 minutes of play, okay? He had great field goal percentage of 48%, and he shot from three 38%, which it doesn't sound too great, but that's, that's pretty good. It's better than what anybody else is doing on the team right now. So you're talking about two dudes that have the best offensive game, or at least the widest range of an offensive game when it comes to shooting, especially, that are out. Brazil's out for the season. Nick Smith will talk about. But there's no teams that can deal with that and then not have offensive struggles. And if you don't believe me, just think about it from your own perspective when it comes to Razorback basketball under, the, under Eric Musselman in the past few seasons. Last year, okay? Think about the offense last year. It wasn't that great, right? But think about if you would have lost J.D. Note and Stanley Amude, your number one scorer and one of your top three scorers there too, offensive players, Note and Amude. If you lost those players, what would that team have looked like? Like it wasn't great offensively as it was, but think about what that offense would have looked like where your offense was going to have to be ran through Jalen Williams, Audis Tony, Devontae Davis, Chris Likes, Trey Wade. Like that would have been probably the team you run out with there. What would that have looked like? Would have been pretty awful, right? What about the year before? Let's say you lose Moses Moody and J.D. Note again. 
Uh, Justin Smith was second on scoring, but say you lose your top score and then J.D. Note was third, you lose them that year. What if that offense would have looked like if you just had Justin Smith, Jalen Tate, Devo Davis, Desi Sills, and Jalen Williams? It would have looked pretty bad and stagnant and n- like nothing simulating what an offense should look like in college basketball. And that's what you're dealing with this year. You're dealing with two guys, as Musk said, they brought them in to base a lot of the team and the performances on these two individuals, especially Nick Smith. And when they're not in there, you're having to ask a lot of these players that are currently on the team to step up and fill roles that maybe they weren't meant to be in or maybe they're not as good at. And you're getting this type of result. Now, again, does that mean that that there's a reason why Arkansas's offense should be as bad as it is? No. I mean, they should still hit free throws at a more effective clip. They, you feel like they should be better at three-point shooting than what they are, but it's not like they're taking a whole lot of threes, at least not here lately. Still too many if you're not making enough of them. But that's what they're dealing with. And I, I know people don't want to hear it. People don't want to hear that. They say it's an excuse. They should get over it. It, it. You know, whatever it is. But I'm telling you, last night, if like or even just this season in general, if you had Nick Smith and Trevin Brazil from the get-go, 100% healthy, from the beginning of the season to right now. There is no doubt in my mind that Arkansas and Bama would have faced each other last night as top, as top five opponents. That would have happened last night. Arkansas would not have lost on the road to LSU. They would not have lost on the road to Auburn. They may not even lost to Creighton. I know that was more of an offensive back and forth, but that one was still tough in Maui. But they don't lose those games if they have a full squad. And again, I know no one's feeling sorry for them. No no one's going to have any sympathy for them. But I'm telling you right now, if Arkansas has those players healthy last night and they were playing, they beat Alabama. It's just a fact. But that's not the reality. That's not the reality that Arkansas lives in. They don't have those guys right now. And so they're having to be the best that they can be. It's a one and three start. Uh, you know, they've done it the past few years. It's happened before. They've been in this position before. Muss has been in this position before. But, you know, it's it's an uphill battle. It really is. It's an uphill battle that Arkansas has to figure out and Muss has to figure out. And luckily, Muss is your coach, and he's one of the best at doing these things. But without those two guys, it's really tough to think that this offense will be able to uh, to get anything going. Now, uh, r- real quick before we take the next segment, but I want to be clear in saying this, that this is not me coming out and saying that this team is done, the season is over, they're trash, they're terrible, like some of you idiots out there have been saying. Like last night, it was so horrible how many Razorback fans were just being dumb and saying dumb things. I get emotions get the best of everybody, gets the best of me sometimes, but the amount of people that just started saying how crappy this team is it's like okay are they to the level that everyone was hoping for no and there's a direct reason for that but they're not a crappy team they're still a team that's going to make the ncaa tournament they're still a team that's going to have a winning record in sec play they're going to beat the majority of their sec foes and i think that it'll be okay from that perspective as far as getting into the ncaa tournament and once you get there all bets are off but this team is not trash it's not crap it's not that at all. You just played some high quality teams without two of your best players out there, and your offense is struggling for it. The defense is great. The rebounding's great. I mean, everything is great. They could be better at ball handling for sure because they do have a few too many turnovers. But like, it literally comes down to offense. Simple as that. So, can they get better? Tell you what, we'll talk about that on the other side of the break. But I want to tell you about betonline.net being your number one source for sports betting info, news, stats, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college bowl season to basketball to World Cup. They got it all. So betonline.net is where you need to go. If you love sports podcasts, you can even find those at BetOnline as well. They're always the fastest and easiest way to get all your sports betting info too. So head to the website or use your mobile device to learn more today at BetOnline, where the game starts. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so continuing on with the Locked On Razorbacks podcast, the question that everyone has, 
for the Razorback basketball team is can they get better? Can they get better? Because as you see in my little sign up there, and as you see down on the ticker below, Arkansas is once again one and three in SEC play, just like they've been the past two years. They were one and three last year, they're one and three the year before. And we all know how those seasons ended up. They ended up being great ones as they made it to the Elite Eight. And uh, both years were the sole SEC team remaining in the NCAA tournaments. Sometimes people forget that. It's amazing. But it, it becomes to where some fans, not all, but some fans are saying, you know what? Well, hey, they've been there before. That They'll be fine. This is, you know, this is something that they can handle. We're used to this, whatever it may be. Well, Muss last night uh, during the press conference after the game was even asked about this. And he kind of put a lot of, I would say concern, but a lot of reality to what people are thinking about as far as this one and three start. Um, like I said, we're no, we're, you know, we can talk about the last two years. We are in a completely and utterly different state um, and in, in, in a way more uphill battle than, 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 than we've been since I've been here, to be quite honest. Oh, you hear him say it. We are in an uphill battle. This is completely different from the past two seasons. And for the reasons we just talked about when it comes to missing out on Smith and Brazil, that's why it's different. Last year, Arkansas had a lot of new faces where they were struggling a little bit defensively, but their offense was, was better. And, you know, they were just trying to figure out the pieces and everyone's trying to figure out their roles. And once it got settled in, it took off. And even the year before that, it was the same way. It's kind of the way that it happens in basketball or particularly at a place like Arkansas, where you have a lot of new faces every year. It may not always get off to the prettiest of starts, but you see, you be able to see exactly how it's going to work. Like you can get an idea of the pieces. And even Musk can see in these practices and in these games. He's like, yeah, I know that they're better. I know that they'll hit their stride. We just got to figure out how it's going to work. That's how it was in the past two years. But this year, it's like, because those two players being out, how are we going to figure this out? Because we don't have this threat. We don't have a three-point. You know, you don't have a J.D. Note who can go out and get buckets or Moses Moody anytime they want or Mason Jones. Like, you don't have that player. You got guys that can score. Like, we know that Ricky Council can score and Anthony Black can score. Uh, we know those guys can bring it in that regard. But – it's not consistent enough, or at least not. no one's confident enough that they can go out and do it game in, game out. Like, you have to be able to count on certain players to get to double-digit points every single game. You had it last year with Note and Williams, and you and even a Mude of cases. You had it the year before with Moses and Justin Smith and J.D. Note as well. You had it the year before that with Mason Jones and Isaiah Joe. Like, you knew that you could count on at least two guys each year to go out there and get you double-digit points every single game. You don't have that. I mean, right now, who do you feel most confident in as far as getting double-digit points game in and game out? I think Ricky Council is probably the one I have the most confidence in. But Anthony Black, no. He's got a lot of great things to his game, but no, he's not that type of player. Jordan Walsh can, but no. Devo Davis can, but no. I mean, really, besides Ricky Council on this, on this team, he's the only one that I feel confident about getting double-digit points every game, and that's a problem. Now, I will say last night, Jalen Graham and the way he played was awesome. Like that was without Jalen Graham, Arkansas isn't even making it a game. He literally gets 16 points on eight of 10 from the field, 19 minutes. He, he was having his way down low offensively, had five rebounds in there, too. And so he had a phenomenal game. And I am so happy for that because I've been someone who really likes Jalen Graham. I like his game. But we also know that there's times where he struggles defensively. And there was even something that happened last night with Musk where he was kept going on and on and on about how great Jalen Graham was. But he's like, but, you know, when the, that three-pointer that really started the run for Alabama late in the second half, you know, Jalen Graham just missed a, missed a pick-and-roll opportunity and, you know, they hit it right in his face. So he does have elements to where he's not as, as great defensively and that's why he hasn't got as many minutes. Because that's people like – and you can't live in this microcosm too, folks, of – if a player coming off the bench has a great game, then that means they need to play more and they should be a factor. Like some cases that may be true, but it was the same thing with Joseph Pinion a few weeks ago, or I guess a week and a half ago, whenever it was against Missouri, where he had a great game coming off the bench and I was like, he should play more. Okay, that's great. But there's going to be times where bench players have really great performances. That doesn't always mean that they need to play more. Like 
And, and, and I'm not saying Jalen Graham does not need to play more. I'm not saying that. But that doesn't automatically equate to it. I mean, how many times have we seen bench players have really great games? And Muss, I think for sure, has earned the benefit of the doubt when it comes to his decision-making and his roster management that if there's a reason why a player is not playing as much, it's for good reason. Like, no, like he's not sitting Jalen Graham because Jalen Graham's too good. There's reasons why. Now, because of last night's performance, maybe that does open up more opportunities for Jalen Graham, but they don't need Jalen Graham or any player coming off the bench to have a game where you have 16 points and five rebounds, and then the next game, you don't even look like you know what you're doing out there. It's about the consistency. And without doubt, like, you know, the guys that are your best options of, of players, like Ricky Council and Anthony Black, you know, those are kind of your best ones. Devo Davis can have some games too. Jordan Walsh, maybe. But Jalen Graham has a great offensive game. His defense is lacking. So maybe because of the performance, it can be better. But I will say, with Musk talking about the one and three start and how it's completely different, it's true. It's 100% true. There's no doubt about that. But the one silver lining in it all that you could maybe take from this, and, and again, this is just if you're a glass half full, glass half empty type of person, but maybe the one thing that you can take from this, at least comparing it to the previous few years, is that this year, Arkansas starts one and three, where two of their three losses are against NCAA tournament teams, or in the case with Bama, the best team in the SEC. Like LSU is not a good team. You should have won that one. That one's bad. But you lost against Auburn, who is, I believe, an NCAA tournament team, and then Bama, who for sure is the best team in the SEC. And you beat a team in Missouri that it probably will make the NCAA tournament. So you're talking about three out of the four first games in SEC play, you played either NCAA tournament caliber teams or the best team in the SEC. Where last year, your first three out of four, you played Mississippi State, Vanderbilt, AM, and Missouri. You won one game against Missouri. Mississippi State, Vanderbilt, and AM were awful. Like those teams were not NCAA tournament teams. And the year before that, you played Auburn, Missouri, Tennessee, uh, Georgia, uh, or LSU. And you lost to Missouri, Tennessee, and LSU. Tennessee made it, LSU made it. Uh, Missouri did not make it. If I'm not mistaken that year, I'd have to go back, but, uh, either way it would, that was a little bit of a tougher schedule than last year. But my whole point is that you have this year, you've played really good teams and your schedule lightens up a little bit more now. Now that doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it lightens it up your next few games, Vanderbilt on the road, Missouri on the road, Ole Miss at home, LSU at home. You have to go three and one in those. I think you can beat Vanderbilt on the road this weekend. I think you're good enough to do that. Missouri on the road, it's always a little bit dicey, tough. I think you absolutely can, but uh, we'll see. It's always tough on the road. But then the Ole Miss at home and LSU at home, you win those games. And so if you can go three and one and get yourself back to where you're sitting at four and four in SEC play and going down to Baylor for the SEC Big 12 Challenge, we'll see how that goes. That will be a tough one. But then even after that, you got AM at home, which you should win. At South Carolina, which you should win. Kentucky's crap on the road. So you might be able to win that one easily, depending on how they look. Mississippi State at home should be a win. At AM should be a win. Florida at home. Georgia at home. Those should be wins. But then you close out the season at Bama, at Tennessee, probably not winning those. And then Kentucky at home, which you should. So the point is, is that you get a really nice stretch in conference play where you can kind of set that spark like you've had in previous years and get it going. And uh, But you have to get better. You have to improve. You have to start doing things that can at least put you in position to be there late in games. You got to make free throws, Dad Gummit. That's another thing. You got to make free throws. That was a team all last year, wasn't a great shooting team, but by George, they made free throws and they won a lot of games at the free throw line. They got to get back to that. But a big part of that is going to be Nick Smith on if he comes back. We have some news on that, but we'll talk about that in just a second. If you're looking for a delicious treat, but don't want all the fat and calories, then you got to try Built Bar. We've got just got through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat a little bit healthier. We're all trying to do that, and it's tough. But you don't want to compromise taste. Then, like, you just got one thing to do. You got to get Built Bar. You got to try it. It's healthy and tasty. They're so delicious, and you won't think that they're good for you. Like, they're that good. It feels like you're eating a candy bar, but it's true. They are good for you. They are healthy for you, and they're covered in 100% real chocolate they have different flavors to choose from 17 grams of protein packed in each and every bar and only 130 calories with four grams of sugar so you're talking about 
the best of all worlds when it comes to Built Bar. And if you go to Built.com, you can check out all the flavors and get you some from there. But you can also find them at your local Walmart and Sam's Club, which I know all of you out there, you probably got a Walmart or Sam's Club close by. If you go over to the pharmacy section. You can check it out. You can grab yourself some Built Bars. And I promise you, you won't be disappointing. So check it out at the website at Built.com and also go to your local Walmart and Sam's Club. That is Built Bar. Be sure to check it out. You are Locked On Razorbacks, your daily podcast on the Arkansas Razorbacks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so final segment here on the Locked On Razorbacks podcast. Nick Smith, that's a question everybody keeps asking. Nick Smith, Nick Smith, Nick Smith. Okay, well, you if you've been listening on this podcast, you have heard me say that I believe Nick Smith will play this year. I have heard it from people I trust. I've heard it from people that would know, and I have been trying to tell everybody that if Nick Smith is 100% healthy this year, he is going to play for the Razorbacks. And there are so many of you that went after me on social media, on Twitter, in the comment section, just saying, you're, you know, it's not true. It's, yo, he ain't playing. He's done. He's a diva. All that stuff. Well, guess what? This morning on my radio station at 103.7 The Buzz, Nick Smith's dad went online and said, Nick Smith will be 100% back this year for the Razorbacks. He will play this year for the Razorbacks 100% guaranteed. That's his dad. At least that's what the report says. So the point is, is that if you are talking about Nick Smith coming back and the fact that his dad is going on airwaves here in Arkansas saying he's coming back, then guess what? He's coming back now you never want to guarantee anything because you know that things can always change when it comes to injuries and setbacks and all of that but it's not going he's not going to not play for the Razorbacks this year because of anything other than having injury issues it's not because he doesn't want to because he's dying to it's not because someone else is telling him not to because he's not listening to anybody but besides himself and the people that matter. He wants to play. He wants to play. Now, there could be a lot of reasons for that. I like to think it's because he want, wants to win a championship for Arkansas and the Razorbacks. He wants to be out there, wants to be with his teammates. I think also part of that, too, is that uh, with the NBA draft, you know, a lot of other people are getting talk, and he's not because he's not playing. So he's like, I want to get I'm, my name out there, and I want to make sure that I'm doing it right. So I think that's a big part of it, too. But the point is, is that for those of you who think that he's not playing, I don't know what else you need to be told. Everybody that I've talked to that knows, that I feel like knows, says he's playing. His dad's going on airwaves and Little Rock on 1037 The Buzz saying he's playing. So he's, he's playing. Let's just believe those people instead of listening to the social media crap. And when he does, when he comes back, does that automatically make Arkansas suddenly uh, the best team in the SEC? Don't know. But I'll tell you this. They're going to be better, especially offensively. And if you have Nick Smith out there being there alone, his presence alone is going to make Arkansas's offense better. It's not because of his shooting percentages and him just going out there and hitting 18 threes a game. No, it's just the fact he's going to be out there and defenses have to adjust and play against him where he can hit threes, he can hit jump shots, he can hit free throws, he can dunk, he can lay it in, he can do it all. And because of that, they're going to have to really target him, and that's going to open up other guys. Nick Smith coming back is going to be huge. I can't wait for it to happen. Hopefully it's happened sooner rather than later because they need that offensive help. But when he does, watch out because the Razorbacks are back and suddenly will be a team that is going to be a force to be reckoned with once again. Appreciate everybody listening in to the Locked on Razorbacks podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or on Google Play. You can also get after me on Twitter at Buzz John Neighbors for any questions, comments, concerns that you may have. We'll keep it going from there. Same podcast time, same podcast channel tomorrow afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you then.